Well, we're back here with another uh, Preps podcast. This is Kyle Nedenrit from the Indy Star, and uh, joined here today by two two guys you you guys probably know pretty well if you follow high school basketball, uh, Trevor Andershock and Jeff Shanley. And uh, you know, it wasn't the the end of the season any of us wanted to to have happen. You know, with the uh, sixty four sectionals getting over, and then the uh, the coronavirus outbreak really kind of took hold uh, right after the sectional. Uh, going into the regional week and you know as we look back a month ago um, you know we thought we were going to play the regional that week and and it got postponed and then uh, of course the following week uh, or I think it was maybe two weeks later the whole the whole thing got canceled so uh, that's kind of where we are now on on April 6th and uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Indian All-Star roster came out today uh, so I want to touch on that, touch on the 13-player the roster. Uh, maybe some of the guys, uh, definitely want to talk about some of the guys that we thought maybe could have got in and, and didn't this year. There's always a few of those. And then I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the season in general uh, with these two guys as well. They they cover a lot of high school basketball uh, throughout the state and, and central Indiana. So uh, they're they're well-versed on, on the best players and best teams in the area. But, uh, you know, thanks for coming on, guys, first of all. Thanks for having me, Kyle. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Kyle. Well, let's let's kind of jump into the the Indian All Stars uh, guys a little bit. Thirteen players on the roster this year, and you know, as it stands right now, we don't know if they're going to play this game uh, because or these two games and the and the junior games because of the the coronavirus. And I would say definitely it's probably unlikely at this point. But uh, as it stands now, they would play June 5th and 6th against the Kentucky All-Stars. And just to run through the list here real quick, uh, in alphabetical order, Trey Coleman of of Jeffersonville, uh, Dre Davis of Lawrence Central, John L. Davis of Gary 21st Century, Malik Edmonds of Brownsburg, Trey Galloway, Culver Academy, uh, Anthony Leo, Bloomington South, uh, Mabor Majok, Hamilton Southeastern, Sincere McMahon of Crispus Attics, uh, Nigel Pack of Lawrence Central, Taysan Parker of Northwestern, Tony Perkins of Lawrence North, Kyron Powell of Evansville Bossy, and Charlie Yoder of Westview. So uh, those 13 players make it, guys. And what you just kind of initial thoughts, uh, maybe start with you, Trevor, on what you thought of the roster, any major surprises uh, from this, and, and you know, kind of the general makeup of this uh, 2020 class, uh, just ha- just as you see this team, uh, kind of from an overall perspective. Yeah, just first off, just the, the makeup of the team. It's a real team, real balanced team. You have the, the big guys, the power forward, guys like Trey Coleman and Dre Davis that can play multiple positions. So I don't think there are any huge surprises. I'd say the biggest surprise for me was Tayson Parker getting in from Northwestern. Obviously had a great career and almost scored 29 a game this season, but coming from a smaller school and he's going to NAIA, Indiana Wesleyan, um, I didn't really kind of project him to be on this roster. So I would say he was the biggest surprise to me. Um, from there, I think everybody else was kind of expected to either be on the team or at least be one of those first guys cut. So no major surprises. Um, as a class overall, um, not the deepest class Indiana had seen. Um, only a few high major guys with Dre Davis, Trey Galloway, Anthony Leal and uh, Tony Perkins. Um, I guess you could put Kansas State in there as well, Big 12, the Nigel Pack. So still a good group of uh, talent, but not quite to the level that uh, Indiana fans are used to. Right. How about for you, Jeff? Wait, there's Jeff already. Jeff may have ducked out for a second here, but... Uh, but yeah, I would agree with you, Trevor, on, on uh, Parker. He may be a guy that uh, people may be a little bit unfamiliar with uh, to a certain extent. Uh, Indiana Wesleyan recruit, um, you know, he's he's a guy who, um, you know, like like you said, Trevor, averaged uh, tw- almost 29 points a game this season, and uh, you know, really, you know, had a great year. They were uh, 17 and five this season. Ended up. Uh, 1,740 career points uh, for Parker. Uh, that ranks him second in Howard County history. But uh, they never, you know, didn't make a, a deep tournament run uh, necessarily. Uh, so we didn't get to see him maybe advance in the tournament. You know, going back to last year, obviously nobody advanced uh, this year beyond the sectional. But uh, yeah, right. but and uh, even and yeah, 
Yeah, I'm back, Kyle. And even with Taysom, they lost in in sectional to West Lafayette, I believe. Um, and that was kind of my surprise pick too, as well. You know, like Trevor said, I didn't think Taysom, you know, had maybe the name recognition around the state. Um, to really get a lot of people to say, hey, this kid's really, really good. Um, playing at the three level, um, Northwestern, not really a a serious state title contender in 3A. You know, I think um, we both thought they would win their sectional or be, you know, among the better teams in that sectional. But beyond that, I didn't think um, Northwestern had a, a huge chance to advance beyond that. Um, so that was my surprise pick as well. They were uh, nineteen and three last year, and seventeen and five this year. So they did they did really uh, play a lot better here these last couple of years uh, since he came. Actually, came as a sophomore, was playing a homeschool basketball. So kind of an interesting story there. And I know the guys up in Indiana Wesleyan are are you know, lo- loving the fact that they're going to have him on their uh, on the roster next year. Uh, but uh, you know, again, as we as we kind of go through this, I think guys, a lot of a lot of these players weren't. You know, maybe guys that we knew were going to be on the team, guys like Dre Davis and, and Nigel Pack, and then uh, uh, Trey Galloway and Anthony Leal, I think were you know all considered locks. Um, you know, I think Tony Perkins, obviously, by the time you know the season started, basically, you know, we knew he was going to make it on the team. So I, I'd say there was probably, you know, maybe you consider five, six, seven, maybe six or seven locks. Uh, you know, as we got in, into the middle of the season. Uh, a guy that maybe um, played his way on this year, I thought, was Sincere McMahon, who, uh, you know, City Player of the Year, uh, Addicts won City. Uh, what do you guys think? He, I mean, he shot uh, 45% from the three-point line and uh, just a shade over 26 points a game. Uh, still uncommitted uh, for college after the coaching change at, at Western Illinois, but uh, I don't think a major surprise that he made the team, but but your guys' thoughts on, on kind of his senior year at Addicts? Yeah, I thought, like you said, his shooting came a long way. Um, he was more of a volume shooter last year, put up some good points, but his efficiency from three, I thought that took his game to a different level this year and really took Addicts to a different level. Um, by the end of the year, they were a contender for 4A and uh, would almost beat LN in that sexual tentile. Yeah, I think, you know, you look at Sincere McMahon, just the relentlessness of how he attacks and the style that he has uh, that he plays. He's always in attack mode. He's always putting pressure on defenses. And that's really, you know, an addict's team that doesn't have a second guy that you can can count on to, you know, do a ton. You know, their state title wing team in 17 led by – um, Nike Sabandi, you know, they had, you know, good secondary pieces. It's really sincere and a bunch of guys who maximize their roles on that team. And, you know, if sincere doesn't play at the level he does, um, I think it goes without saying addicts doesn't have near the success they had this year. Yeah, they were a fun team to watch because there was times, you know, Jalen uh, uh, Carson uh, came on in the in the city and I think he had 26 points maybe in that championship game, but but that was that was pretty unusual. He didn't uh, always produce that way. But they had di- kind of different guys who who would come along and, and step up for him uh, throughout the season. And, and really, I think I think McMahon, um, you know, if he wasn't on the team already, I think his performance in in sectional 10 and that in that loss to Lawrence North uh, probably uh, put him over the top. Even though they got beat in that game. Uh, I think he kind of showed everybody, you know, what type of player he had been all year, really, if you hadn't noticed up to that point. And uh, that probably, you know, put him in for sure if he wasn't already. Wanted to touch on another guy, too. Um, you know, Malik Edmonds is, is interesting from Brownsburg. Uh, he's going to Marion, six foot six, and uh, started off the year really strong. I mean, he ended up averaging 17.1 points and uh, 7.5 rebounds. Uh, Brownsburg was 21 and four, uh, won won their sectional, uh, but also he missed eight games with the with an ankle injury, so uh, limited to, limited a little bit uh, b- because of that. Only played in 17 games. Uh, what were your guys' thoughts? Any any surprise to see uh, Malik make the team, or did you guys feel like he was a, a pretty much a lock at this point? I thought he was a real big surprise. Um, outside of Chase, I would say he's the biggest surprise. 
Um, like you said, missing the games, I thought that would be a disqualifier. Um, I guess winning the sectional really helped him, but I've always been a big fan of Malik. Um, I've been waiting for him to take that next step, and it seems like in his senior year, he finally became that go-to score, consistent producer, and earned him spot, or himself a spot on this team. So, a surprise, but I think he uh, definitely played well enough to get a spot. Yeah, he was a kid who... I think when Trevor and I had talked about, you know, who we would have on this all-star team, you know, we had maybe eight or nine guys, probably nine guys that we were, yeah, this is a definitely, you know, we feel pretty good about this. And then Malik was maybe one of a, a dozen kids for those next four spots. And like Trevor said, I thought missing, you know, a third of the season was going to um, – kind of prevent him from even being considered to be honest with you that's a pretty good chunk of the year for somebody who didn't come in you know it'd be different if you know like Trey Galloway missed um I think it was you know maybe three or four weeks maybe close to a month with his wrist injury but Trey came in with that name already to this year having won a state title being committed to Indiana um he was a big time performer. Malik didn't really have that. And then to miss a third of the season on top of that, I just thought from with those things going against him, it was going to be really hard for him to be picked. So yeah, that was definitely a surprise to me, not taking anything away from Malik's game. Like uh, Trevor said, he really came on. It was kind of a focal point for a really good Brownsburg team, but I just thought those out, kind of outside factors would have prevented him from getting selected. I think uh, one factor that definitely did help him was, Right after, uh, not too long after he came back from that injury, uh, towards the end of the season, the Center Grove game, and I happened to be there uh, covering a different story on on one of the Center Grove players, but uh, Edmonds went out, and and Mike Broughton, the the All-Star game director, was there, and uh, he had 30, I think 31 or 32 points in that game. Uh, So if, uh, you know, if if Broughton, you know, if he was hedging or, you know, uh, didn't know what he was going to do, I think that helped uh, Malik's chances. And kind of, you know, as a general point as well, I mean, there's a lot of those type of games we didn't get to see happen, you know, because of the because the tournament yeah. got got uh, canceled. You know, there's a lot of those games where you look back at the history of, of who makes all-star teams or who, who wins uh, Mr. Basketball, a lot of that stuff's decided, you know, in these tournament games. And, you know, we didn't get to see, you know, some of those ties get broken, you know, or, or a guy maybe play his way onto a team like, uh, you know, Eugene German. And we'll talk about one of the guy who played at his same high school here in a minute. But, you know, he made the team by the, the uh, top 100 workout. So, you know, a lot of those things that maybe change the uh, dynamics of this team, and I, I don't know that this team would be any different or not uh, if we would have played the tournament, but you, it, it does make you wonder because this is not a, you know, it's not a, a complete season. Uh, so, you know, there might have been some some outstanding performances, and maybe some of the guys, I'm sure some of the guys on this list anyway, would have had those performances, but uh, there might have been another guy or two who, who played his way onto this team. Yeah, and you, you don't even have to go as far back as Eugene German. Just look at last year and the run that Ben Davis had to the state title game. You know, Jalen Windham, I thought, played his way onto the team with the way he played yeah. throughout the year. You know, I think Kyle Weed even talked about last year, maybe him and Jared Hankins for a, a shooter for that all-star team and the way Wyndham played in the state tournament, you know, along with DeWan Jones leading them to the state championship game, I think, you know, that's how he got put on the state the all-star team last year so um definitely we missed those opportunities and that might have been you know if we only got sectional that might have been a couple of these guys who were just on the outside looking in um on these selections might have not had those opportunities to to make a statement here at the regional or semi-state round and jumping ahead to the mr basketball race i think a lot of those guys were still alive so yeah. i think that that was affected big time as well just not the guys who might have played themselves on their team, but deciding Mr. Basketball was really up in the air too for me at least. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll touch on that here in a few minutes as well. Uh, but wanted to go through the, the the list a little bit deeper here, and you guys have had a chance to see John L. Davis uh, from Gary Twenty First play uh, both in the summer and with his high school team. Uh, his numbers were just unbelievable this year. He, he's headed to Florida Atlantic. Uh, 31.4 points, 9.8 rebounds, uh, 4.6 steals. And uh, he set the all-time uh, school record with uh, 2,228 points. 
and uh, you know just had a huge monster season uh, for Gary 21st, which plays a very uh, tough schedule. They're a one A 1A team, but you know play a lot of three A and four A schools. Play a lot. You know they come down here uh, to Indianapolis and play a lot. And uh, I you know I think he uh, definitely earned his way onto this team and, and probably will get himself uh, quite a few Mr. Basketball votes as well uh, once those are all counted up. Yeah, I thought Janelle just had a huge year, put Gary 21st century on his back, really. And obviously the 31 points a game jumps out at you, but 4.6 steals a game is ridiculous. Yeah. Especially, like you said, playing against high-quality competition, too. This isn't, this yeah, is it's, not a tip, it's not a typical 1A schedule. that They, they came down, and I think they beat Addicts, Addicts like, uh, some ridiculous score, like yeah. 101 to 97 or something like that. And he no, had. Quite a close. Yeah, close game. And that was the yeah. close one. Okay. Yeah, and he and had a ridiculous line. Run. Yeah, and so it's not like he's just doing this up against some, you know, a bunch of 1A teams with kids who, you know, won't play college. I mean, he's. He puts up those numbers against really good 4A teams too. Um, it's not a it's not a fluke with him. I really enjoyed watching him last year um, with Indy Heat in the summertime. You know that was obviously a really talented group with Caleb First, um, Dre Davis, Nigel Pack, um, Jaden Ivy, and John L. started on that group. And he played. He just kind of was their glue guy and just figured out where he could affect games played a lot like reminded me a lot of chris kramer purdue he would just defend people get to the basket not do anything crazy you know or do something he couldn't do um and just really fit in that role well i think dusty made uh, florida atlantic got a steal with john i think he's gonna be a really really impactful player at the college level yeah one thing you notice about him in the with the uh space indy heat team is he rebounds really well and that you know that showed up in the in the stat sheet for him during the high school season as well. But uh, he didn't he didn't score a ton for that Indy Heat team. But he you're right he played plays a pretty good role. Uh, so then I'm I'm sure was ready to come back and be the the main guy uh, for that team this year. But probably not a huge shock uh, that he's on this team. But uh, definitely had a had a great year uh, for Gary 21st. Uh, you know, looking down the list a little bit, and, and we'll we'll kind of go through some of the the guys who are the Mr. Basketball uh, front runners uh, when we get to that portion of it. But one guy who's probably not going to be uh, among those finalists, but I thought had a really good career, Trey Coleman uh, from Jeffersonville, uh, headed to Nevada, uh, 15.5 points this year, 2.3 block shots, and uh, 7.1 rebounds, and efficient. You know, he was 65% from the field. And Jeffersonville uh, went to 18 and six this year. They lost though in the sectional, so no no uh, advanced. Uh, they wouldn't have been playing on in the tournament, uh, so their season had ended, which is it's kind of disappointing for this Jeffersonville team that had a lot of talent, uh, but but maybe just couldn't quite put it all together uh, in the sectional. Your guys' thoughts on on Coleman and uh, his selection to this team? Yeah, I thought Coleman. You know, he had a solid career. He's probably one of those guys that. He's not a scorer by nature. Um, he would rather handle the ball, rebound, set guys up, do the small things, and then just kind of score what he needs to. So his points per game doesn't jump out at you. But when he's playing with a group of good quality players, kind of like at the AAU or college level, that's where his game really shines when he can do those little things to help the team win. So definitely no surprise that he's on this team. And like you said, Jefferson real. I thought they might have been the favorite coming into this year um, with Coleman, Will Lovings Watt, Jacob Jones, that whole group. Um, and then Coach Luce um, resigns right before the season, and Will Lovings Watt doesn't finish the year. So the wheels kind of just came off for him, and Trey was kind of stuck in the middle of trying to keep them together. But uh, like you said, couldn't pull them through the uh, sectional. Yeah, I think that instability down there um, at Jeffersonville, obviously they had high expectations going into the year. Um, and, you know, a lot a lot was expected of Trey, I think, going into this year. And maybe unfairly too much get, got put on his shoulders of, hey, you have to be, you know, the one to carry this team and you guys can make it to state. And I think it's hard for high school kids to – to figure out 
how to handle that, you know, and, and Trey's, like Trevor said, a kid who, you know, his real value is going to be, you know, not scoring 20 a game, but, you know, he can defend multiple positions, he can rebound, um, he's a very strong kid, I mean, you look at him and you would think this kid could, could be a big time tight end prospect, um, so I think that's where, like Trevor said, his value lies. I think maybe some unfair expectations. And people thought he had a disappointing year based on those expectations. But really it was, I mean, Jeffersonville had a good year. And Trey was the main constant that they had. Yeah, and his, his numbers weren't weren't any, you know, anything bad or any. He shot 65% from the field. So that's hard to, hard to argue with. And he's one of those guys, I think he's going to go on and be a – uh, a really good college player. I just I've always I've always liked his game a lot. And I thought going into the year he could be one of those dark horse uh, Mr. Basketball types, but uh, that's probably not going to be the case. But I, I think he's I think he'll go on and have a a really solid high school career. Uh, and while we're talking, or I'm sorry, college career. But while we're while we're talking about big guys, uh, you know, Kyron Powell from Evansville, Bossy, kind of another guy who maybe his points uh, aren't aren't the the main thing he does, but. Uh, 14.6 points, uh, 12.4 rebounds, uh, more than seven block shots per game, and uh, you know a, a team that went 18 and seven, and a loss to a tough. You know they were in a really tough sectional, uh, but he was part of a lot of winning teams there at Bossy. They were a, a 3A state finalist uh, when he was a sophomore, and uh, so he with Makai Larry as part of that team, a, a big part of that team. So. Powell's always been one of those guys. He's going to Houston uh, to play college basketball. Always been one of those guys. He, he's not going to go out and score 30 points a game, but he may get 30 rebounds and, and, uh, and 10 block shots. You know, he's, he's one of those type of guys. Uh, a really good athlete and, and, again, probably a guy that I you know thought was going to be on this team for sure, and, uh, and I thought he, he did a nice job earning his way onto it this year. Yeah, to build on what you're saying, Kyle, he's a guy that – could get a triple double each game, but it was usually was he going to get enough points to get there? <laughs> right, it's kind of the opposite of what most guys are in high school. But yeah, like you said, great shot blocker, good rebounder, and then in his senior year, here his offensive game really come around. He can step away from the basket, hit a fifteen footer. That range continues to improve. So he's a guy that has the, the high upside. A lot of people talk about for college level and. Maybe even beyond if he uh, stays focused and keeps progressing like he had the last few years. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think the guard play this year down at Bossy they that had you know Colton Sanford and that crew down there really helped with that offensive um, you know development for Kieran. Those guards being able to help get him in positions to where um, he doesn't have to create a ton on his own. He can just focus on picking his spots and finishing. But I mean, like you said, the block shot numbers are just unbelievable you know you want to go down and talk to the other coaches in Evansville and be like why do you why do you tell your guards <laughs> to keep challenging him like right why go why go in there like you know he's going to send it back um the, the numbers in the block shot category are I mean we haven't seen that since you know a long time maybe Greg goes, oh, I, w- I want to yeah I want to name Shark. I thought he's gonna Greg say the best he got. I thought he's gonna say Akeem Olajuwon I mean, yeah, yeah, Patrick Ewing maybe, but, you know, at Indiana high school level, you know, Odin probably the last person as a shop, as just a shot blocker that you just couldn't challenge. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the numbers were ridiculous. And, again, he's down in Evansville, maybe doesn't get seen by as many people um, around the state, uh, but definitely a great career there for Keegan yeah, he's he's a guy too. I think uh, you know the best is ahead of him. You know, the, you talk about these big guys, and normally they just get better. You know, as they get in a weight college weight room and, and uh, you know get get plugged into a, a good system and and that sort of thing. And you know, I think he's a guy we'll be you know we'll be seeing in the NCAA tournament or you know like Trevor said maybe in, maybe beyond that uh, at, at some point he's he's got that type of frame and, and athletic ability. Uh, as, as long as he continues to keep improving his offensive game, he's got a really, really high ceiling uh, for his future. But uh, also another big guy, seven footer uh, from HSE, Mabor Majok, averaged uh, 11.4 points. Again, points, you know, that, and that's a team that you know they're they're going to share the ball. 
Um, so the points isn't necessarily his biggest thing, but he has also improved a lot, I think, offensively. Uh, but 10 rebounds a game, which is a, a very good improvement uh, for, for Mabor. Uh, 2.6 block shots. And uh, he helped uh, HSC to really, I thought, a, a great season. Uh, that was a fun team to cover, 17-6 uh, and six, uh, on the season, a share of the HCC uh, championship. Uh, Mabor shot uh, 65% from the field and uh, finished as a, he was a, as a, you know, a three-year player, played a little bit his freshman year, but uh, I thought made steady improvement throughout. And he's a guy, too. He was probably one of the, um, you know, you, you, one of the guys who had to play his way onto the team this year, and and uh, Mike Broughton uh, thought highly of him and, and put him on the team. And I think uh, the season HSC had probably helped him a lot, but he was a big part of what they did there, and and, uh, and, and I was glad to see he made this team. Yeah, yeah on the stretch, HSC was playing as well as anybody in the state. Um, that was kind of a surprise because uh, preseason expectations weren't that high, and then. Even to start the year, they weren't playing that well. And Mabor kind of found found his groove there as an offensive player and obviously was controlling the paint defensively. But like you said, he was a big reason why HSD had so much success this year. And um, he kind of just kept building on, on his base of fundamentals and really started to produce this year. I think that, you know, after that group of, you know, eight or nine locks we talked about, there were a dozen kids for those next, you know, four spots or so. I think Mabor is at that top of that group of, you know, 12 to 15 kids. Um, his improvement as a rebounder, because, yes, he's seven feet tall, but he's not not the most well-built kid. You know, he's very slender, um, doesn't have a ton of functional strength, but whatever he had, he was willing this year, I think, for the first time in his high school career to just go in and say, hey, I don't know what's going to happen. I may not physically be able to beat people with my strength, but I'm going to throw whatever weight I have around and just worry about getting the basketball. And I think really as a rebounder, because that HSE team, it's not – you know, there's no Gary Harris or Zach Irvin or, you know, any big time players, even a Zach Gunn on that roster. It was really by committee. And I think, you know, when they went on that 13 game winning streak, they kind of found that Mabor had to be their centerpiece, had to be their focal point, that everybody else plays off of him. Um, and I mean, they they beat Lawrence North at the end of the regular season at Lawrence North in a, in a great high school basketball game. And, um, you know, Unfortunate that they get Carmel in the first round of sectionals. You know, their biggest rival, and Carmel's one of the best teams in the state as well. So, um, but yeah, I think HSC success had a lot to do with it. But give credit to Mabor for kind of seizing the opportunity that he had at HSC this year and, and really um, capitalizing on it. Yeah, he was a big piece. Uh, Cole Hornbuckle, and, uh, you know, I thought he was, he played really well too down the stretch for that team. Uh, probably a lot better player than people realize who don't uh, you know see a lot of basketball in Central Indiana. But uh, that was a good, te- really good team. And, and like uh, Jeff just said, I think there probably was a, a group of eight or nine that that were you know considered locks. Mabor wasn't one of those, but I think you know with the season he had, played his way into it. And then guys, another uh, player, uh, Charlie Yoder. I don't think he'll be among the Mister Basketball. Uh, front runners, but uh, he he averaged uh, 27.3 points a game this year for Westview, 11 point uh, 11 rebounds, 5.6 assists, 3.3 steals. Uh, Westview is a 2A team. They're uh, 21 and four uh, this year, and uh, he ended up setting the career scoring record uh, at Westview with uh, 2,163 points. Uh, set the single season, single season record and single game record as well. So, uh, a lot of honors, a lot of accolades uh, for Charlie Yoder, uh, who who remains undecided for college. You know, I had a chance to to go up and I did a feature on Westview last year, uh, just kind of about uh, the the uh, you know that part of the state and and the kind of the Amish tradition that's up there and the, a little bit different up there and it's cool and they they really support their basketball and uh, Charlie Yoder's been a big part of that here the last three or four years so uh, a really good career uh what are you guys thoughts on, on charlie yoder as a player and, and uh you know kind of you know his his uh place on this team i thought he kind of like we were talking about Mabor. um westview wasn't off to a great start this year um they were kind of expected to challenge 
challenge for the 2A state title the last couple of years, but this year with the graduation of Elijah Hales and a couple other, it was really just Charlie Yoder, and it took him a while to figure out, all right, I have to put this team on my back and look for every shot that I can. And that's when they kind of hit their stride and started to win a lot of big games uh, in the middle of the season and down the stretch. Obviously, 27 points a game is impressive, but I like how he, how he does it. He finds the little spots, the little scoring opportunities, transition, off cut, coming off screens, handling the ball. He can do a little bit of everything, and he finds those scoring opportunities so well. So I thought he, he was well-deserving of being on this Indiana All-Star team. Yeah. I think, you know, like, like Trevor said, it's almost a career – award for him because he's been so consistent throughout the years and you know Westview didn't win their sectional this year but that they're in probably the toughest two-way sectional in the state with them and then three other really good teams in Prairie Heights Central Noble and then Cherubusco who ended up uh, coming out of that sectional at Westview I thought what helped Charlie Yoder was his junior year them being in the Hall of Fame tournament they almost knock off um, Center Grove and Trace Jackson Davis I think they lost by five to them in a really close game and Charlie had a good game and then the consolation game they played Valpo with Nate Ayers and Brandon Newman who's now at Purdue and Charlie had I want to say like 37 or 38 in the consolation game against a really good Valpo team and that kind of you know, you're at the Hall of Fame. It's a huge stage, you know, in Indiana high school basketball. And even though it's a consolation game, to put up those numbers against a kid who was a Mr. Basketball contender last year, I thought really showcased him to a statewide audience and um, and really helped kind of keep his name fresh in people's mind this year. Like Trevor said, you know, it went from Charlie being the best player in a really good team to Charlie being really the only focal point of Westview this year, you know, losing a lot to graduation. So he had to do a ton and and still led them to a really good season. Yeah, he was, uh, like you mentioned, those opportunities are so big, you know, whether it's the Hall of Fame or, you know, a big tournament game or, you know, it's kind of a, especially if you can do that before your senior year and kind of get your name out there. Uh, that's exactly. a good, that's a good point uh, to make because you do it at the Hall of Fame. It's a little bit different, you know, than than anywhere else. So uh, that's important, I think, and a, and a good point. His his dad Rob is the coach there at uh, Westview, and uh, he plays. I he he is a very hard worker. I can tell you that from being up there and uh, being around that program. And and uh, you know, I don't know what his future holds as far as college goes just yet. Uh, but somebody's going to get a pretty good player uh, in Charlie Yoder. Uh, and we're going to save uh, these the last five guys we're going to talk about when we talk about Mr. Basketball uh, here in a minute. But wanted to touch base with you guys on, you know, we always kind of put together, you know, whether it's me or you or whoever, uh, kind of a, a, you know, a snub list or who missed out kind of list. And, you know, I hate to call it snub list because then it means you're talking about guys who, who made the team who aren't deserving, in my opinion. But I, So I don't mean it to be that. But, you know, always put together a list of, of guys who I thought had a, a good chance to make it. And I've got a few names, and, and I don't think the list is, is terribly long this year. I, I think there's guys who had a, you know, had a good argument. And uh, I'm going to throw a name out there first, and then you guys can, can throw them out there too. But... Uh, one guy I know his name came up a lot, and uh, I wrote a little bit about it. Max uh, Maximus Gizzi from uh, New Palestine. He was, uh, you know, a guy who had a really good career uh, at, at New Pal. Led led that team to back to back sectional championship uh, uh, championships. They were going to play in the regional again this year at Southport against uh, Lawrence North. Uh, he ends his career with a, a, a school record of uh, 1,612 points and also uh, school records in assists and steals. And this year was 23.4 points, 3.5 rebounds, uh, 3.4 assists. And the team wasn't, you know, they, they, they were 14 and 12, and it kind of took them a while to get going. Uh, had a couple of football kids who didn't play uh, that helped them last year. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things, too, like we talk about, what if, you know, the what if game, 
you know, what if they get in that uh, regional and he goes out and, and has a great game and they pull the upset nobody saw coming? You know, not to say that would have happened, but, you know, it's kind of the, the, the thing you wonder. Uh, maybe maybe a, a great performance there puts him over the top. And I know he was a guy that, that Mike Broughton was considering uh, throughout the year. Uh, you had to be. Uh, so, you know, he, he's a name that, that came to mind first uh, when I looked at the list and he, and he wasn't on it. Uh, who else, guys? You know, any thoughts on that? And then, kind of, who else? You know, did you have on your on maybe your list of guys who had a good argument for the team? Yeah, like you were saying, I was probably going to use that Lawrence North matchup in regionals for uh, Gizzy to kind of decide if he was worthy of being a uh, selection here. So I had him on the outside looking in, but um, like you said, great career. 1,500 points, you can't argue with that. He did it efficiently um, and made New Pal a real threat in 4A, um, which I haven't been in a long time. So, obviously a great career. Um, the main guy for me was Andrew Wellich from Greensburg. Um, I thought his overall career was great, um, consistent, 16 points a game throughout his career, and then 21 as a senior here. Um, and then he, he kind of did a little bit of everything for the Pirates scoring, rebounding, you know, the ball a lot throughout his career. I thought he was worthy of a, of a spot here. Yeah, I would say on, on yeah. Wellage, uh, too, just to butt in real quick, I, I think he – you know, if he's a guy you see come up on the list when it comes out, you're like, oh yeah, well, he, that makes sense. You know, and you wouldn't even you wouldn't even think twice about it, and uh, you kind of would expect it in a, in a lot of ways. But uh, so that's another good one. I think I, I completely agree. Yeah, I, I think Wellage was um, probably my number one omission. You know, he at six six to play the he played the point guard. Uh, spot for Greensburg this year. They didn't really have a true point guard, um, so he steps into there. He can shoot, get to the basket. He rebounds. Um, he can defend uh, for a really, really good three A team. I know um, at the start of the state tournament, I had them as you know maybe one of the favorites to win the three A state title. I know um, you know they were in a really tough regional with Silver Creek and Heritage Hills and Washington um, that obviously didn't come to fruition, but. Uh, the other name, um, you guys have mentioned Wellage. I'm going to throw out uh, Noah Jagger from Bloomington South. Um, for a team that really kind of lacks pure point guard play, um, Nigel Pack, obviously a really good point guard. Um, he's probably the head of this list. And then you could look at Sincere McMahon, but he's almost more of a scoring-minded point guard instead of a, a setup guy. Um, same with Taysom Parker, a big-time scorer. I thought Noah, you know, playing at Bloomington South the year they had, um, I thought they were definitely deserving of two Indiana All-Stars. Um, and he's a lot better than I think the numbers would say. Um, I went and saw them play in the sectional semifinals against Columbus North, and Mike Broughton was at that site, at Columbus North that night. And Noah was phenomenal. I think hit four threes, including, I think, three in a row in the second quarter. Um, had steals, set guys up, guarded people, you know, did a lot. And um, I thought, you know, even that night, I saw, you know, brought in there and I said, man, Noah, Noah Jagger's playing his way onto the Indiana All-Star team tonight. You know, he's going to be, you know, I guess the backup point guard behind Nigel Pack, likely. Um, so I thought he was um, certainly deserving, um, and uh, I probably would have had him as one of the you know maybe last three guys selected um, if I were to pick the roster. Yeah, that's that's another good one, and that's another one I had uh, kind of on that top of that list. He was a guy he ended up with uh, had a school record with 544 uh, career assists. So you know that's a number that. That's a blue south too there's been some players that have come through there now. yeah there's been there's been some good ones and uh his his points per game was 10 points 10 point seven so you know that's not a a huge amount but that's a team that is really balanced and you know he doesn't have to go out and score you know t- kind of like gizzy where gizzy has to go score a lot and he can and he's good at it uh jager's not that's not necessarily his role uh for that for that team and they also went 26 and 0 and uh, they they would have been a top contender to to win in four A. So again, you know if they're holding the trophy at the end of the end of the season, you know I would not have been surprised at all to see Noah Jager you know earn his way onto that team as well. No doubt. Uh, I gotta put uh, one guy in 
into uh, consideration here too, Kyle. Uh, Nick Anderson from Lake Central. Mm-hmm. Um, I he was one of the two guys I voted for that didn't make it. Uh, him and Andrew Wellich. Anderson just had a unbelievable senior year for Lake Central. I think it was around 24 points a game while getting face guarded every game. Um, LC really didn't have anybody else on the offensive end to help him. So he was on his own. And he still was able to produce game in, game out, um, just finding tiny spots to get a shot off. And as a shooter, he was the best shooter I saw all season. Um, just lights out, off the dribble, off the catch, coming off screens. Um, if he had an a inch of space, he was going down. And I thought that kind of, I know his team didn't have great success, even though they made it to the sectional final against Maryville and lost by a couple points. Um, but as an overall player, I thought Nick Anderson was just incredible this season. Yeah, he, he uh, he's a guy I was kind of tracking throughout the year as well. Big-time shooter. Uh, was over 24 points a game, and I thought, you know, again, if uh, things go differently and if they beat Merrillville, you know, and they can like make a little run in, in in a big game, and he goes out and he's capable of going out and scoring 35 in, in a big game. So he's another guy uh, that that had a, you know, I thought had a chance, and uh, I know he's a hard worker as well. Made himself into a, a really really good player uh, for Lake Central, um, you know. Also. Josh Smith of Monrovia was a guy that was talked about a lot. Um, you know, they again though they didn't get through. You know, lost to Danville in the uh, 3A sectional. Um, you know, if they can win that, you know, pull that game out, that's a tough assignment though. Danville was really really good, uh, but his numbers were 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 very very good this year for Monrovia. They were 18 and six. Uh, he ended up with uh, over 1,100 career points. Uh, 21.9 points this year, 11.9 rebounds, 2.7 block shots, and uh, two assists per game. S- Smith was probably Smith and Wellage both. There, there's a, this team had quite a few wings, you know, kind of versatile wing type players. That's kind of why I thought maybe Gizzy or Jager uh, would have had a better chance, as, as Jeff mentioned, as like a backup uh, point guard situation, which which uh, they don't necessarily have on this All Star team. But uh, maybe you don't need one on an All Star team, but. Anyway, I, I thought you know maybe those two had a better chance than Wellage or Smith because of that reason. Uh, but uh, you know Smith a good year nonetheless, and he's headed to Stetson next year. And uh, you know one of those guys that, that probably belongs in the conversation if you're talking about guys uh, kind of who had a good argument but were left off the team. Yeah, he was on that cut that me and Jeff talked about, um, kind of on that those four or five final spots and. He was definitely discussed, but I thought he would need to do just a little bit more. Um, Monrovia obviously leaned on him a lot to do everything, but if he could have just done a little bit more, I think he would have got on the team. Either shot a little bit better from three or just been a little bit more aggressive offensively. I think that would have given him a little bit more of a boost to, to make the squad here. Yeah, I mean, you look at, you know, Monrovia has one of their, their better years, but... So much of this, I think, like we mentioned when we started talking about this, a lot of those end of the roster picks for the All Star team come down to who's able to do a lot in big moments in the state tournament. And, you know, unfairly, you know, as it is, a lot of these guys didn't get that moments. You know, who's to say if, you know, Andrew Wellage and Greensburg come out of that regional and they have to beat Silver Creek in the championship game or beat a really good Heritage Hills team and Wellage has, you know, 30 and 10 in that game, well, then he gets to a pick. Or Bloomington South, you know, wins state and goes undefeated. Then Noah Jagger, you know, they get two all-stars. Or, you know, if Monrovia can make it to semi-state in 3A. Um, just a lot of different things that, unfortunately, we weren't able to see play out this year due to, uh, due to the tournament being uh, canceled. Yeah, it makes you wonder, uh, you know, and even a guy like Dylan Ware from Danville, you know, if they if they go on and win state or something like that, you know, who knows? You know, who knows what could happen uh, as far as All Star honors or you know whatever. But uh, anybody else that we haven't talked about on this this list that that you guys think uh, could have a case? I think my the main next guy for me would be Carson Barrett of Lafayette Central Catholic. Mm-hmm. Uh, just his, his overall career of doing a little bit of everything, 1,600 points, 1,000 rebounds, a big assist guy. 
Um, I, I would say he had a great case to be on the team, but uh, like we said, he didn't get out of section at all, so that probably played against him a little bit. Yeah, you know, Carson, from, you know, the first game of his freshman year, he showed that he was, you know, one of the best players in 1A, um, you know, even when he was a freshman and um, really had never been a big scorer uh, this year, had to score a little bit more for them, but still the rebound and assist numbers were uh, phenomenal. Uh, um, again, them not getting out of section, which they faced a really good Covington team in the opening round and lost Covington. I think, you know, Trevor and I were, you know, going through last night trying to figure out how this state tournament would have played out. I mean, we had uh, Covington going to semi-state, um, so it's not like they were upset or anything. They lost to a really good team. But um, you look at Carson as obviously a, you know, a, a big pick there. I think um, to me, and, and maybe this wasn't a, uh, high up on the list um i thought the year braxton barnheiser had the numbers he put up for a really good lafayette jeff team could have warranted some consideration i don't know if i would have put him up there with you know the andrew wellage and noah jagger you know omissions of yeah i would have had them on my team but i thought you know he deserved to be in the conversation a little bit um with the numbers he put up uh, for a really good bronco squad up there yeah he had uh yeah. he, he scored over a thousand points in two seasons and I was looking at his numbers today as well. You know, when we talked about this um, this team and him not making it, forty three percent from the three point line. And hey, any guy who will pull up from the volleyball line consistently, that's that's my kind of guy. So I, I, I went. Hey, I saw him against Richmond and uh, towards the end of the regular season, he pulled up from the edge of the center circle. Like the volleyball <laughs> line is well inside of his range. It's like a free throw. Yeah, <laughs> and even that he's just back up. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I've uh, never seen a kid shoot a pull up for a free throw, but Braxton Barnheiser checks that off the list. <laughs> the uh, the other guy, you know, and I don't think he would have, you know, probably had a great chance, but a guy who showed out in the the sectional was uh, J.K. Thomas from uh, uh, Marion, and uh, he had 32 points in a, in the second half of a win over Harrison, 18 in the fourth quarter. And that team playing without Jalen Blackman uh, would have been going on to the regional. And, uh, you know, that that's a guy that maybe could have, you know, you talk about the what ifs, you know, he could have energized people, you know, by, by the way he can play. Uh, again, high, you know, he, he, he puts up numbers. I mean, he's going to get his shots off and he's going to put up some points. Uh, fun to watch, you know, fun, fun to watch type of player. Uh, so he's, 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 he would not have been ready when J.K. Thomas checked in the game. That would have been something <laughs> they would have not been prepared for. <laughs> he's, he's a true definition of a close though. He's either going to score a ton or it's going to go badly. Yeah. But it's fun to watch either way. It is fun. Uh, and what, a, what a competitor, too. I mean, he is the yeah. definite. I mean, he's – I don't even want to put a size on him because I'm probably going to overstate it. I mean, he's 5'9", maybe 5'10". Um, yeah, you're giving him like three or four inches. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if he's that small, but I'd like five eight, five nine. I mean, but you talk about just a, a pit bull of a competitor, and he's going at people um, every single game. And you know, Marion had a really good squad. Um, even you know, after Blackman leaves, they have the sophomore Rasheed Jones, who's a really intriguing prospect in that 2022 class. Um, but man, J.K. That's a spark plug, and yeah, he he checks in the game. Something's going to happen. I don't know what it is, but something will happen. Those are the kind of guys I like to cover. Something's going to happen. Make something happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and let's let's kind of go double back on uh, the Mister Basketball race. Uh, there was five guys on that All Star team uh, that we didn't talk about. That I kind of saved for this uh, conversation was uh, DeAndre Davis and Nigel Pack of Lawrence Central. Uh, Trey Galloway from Culver Academy, Anthony Leal from Bloomington South, and uh, who am I missing here? Oh, uh, Tony Perkins, Lawrence Tony North. Perkins. Lawrence North. Man, Kyle slipping. <laughs> I had to scroll down here to, on my uh, alphabetical list. Uh, but let's start with Tony. They he he was a name that maybe you know maybe people didn't have uh, necessarily in that Mr. Basketball discussion. I think he was kind of right on the periphery, in my opinion. I think you know before the season, I had. You know, five guys I thought could win it, and I, I had him kind of on the outside as number six. Uh, became 
clear, you know, pretty quickly, you know, after they beat uh, Lawrence Central, that he was gonna he was gonna be a factor uh, no matter what. Uh, so uh, Tony Perkins averaged 18.6 points, 5.6 rebounds, 3.5 assists, and 1.8 steals per game. Lawrence North was uh, 25 and two, and uh, he led them to their first sectional title since 2015 and only the second one since uh since 09 so it, it's kind of surprising but uh makes sense based off that competition in that sectional uh he shot 58 percent and was 35 percent from three and uh 1152 career points for uh, tony perkins so uh, i gotta say you know he he was a a guy that I really love to cover this year. He was such an energizer for that team, uh, kind of the the glue guy. And uh, you know, he's our best overall player, but he's also the glue guy. You know, he's he's kind of their energizer. And and uh, I thought he had a great senior year. Would have liked to see what he could have done beyond the sectional, uh, like we like I keep saying. But uh, you know, would have been fun to see how far he could have helped take this team. And and I thought he was. Uh, everything you'd want uh, from a Mr. Basketball candidate pretty much from game one until uh, the sectional got over with. Yeah, and for me, it kind of, the debate for Mr. Basketball usually comes down to the career award or a single season award. Because Tony obviously had a good overall career, but took things to a different level this year, like you said. Um, made Lawrence North the team to beat in 4A, which is obviously tough. And he was the main reason why game in, game out, he was so consistent on both ends that he kind of forced his name into that consideration, um, like I said, a couple, couple games into the season and stood there the, the whole way. So it would have been fun to see how far LN would have got if they would have won the state title, if they possibly would have played Bloomington South in the semi-state and see exactly how Perkins would have done in those situations. Yeah, I think, and Kyle, you read off his numbers, and maybe the numbers are what you would immediately think of when you think of somebody who you can or maybe would be a front runner or favorite for Mr. Basketball with 18.5 points, 5.5 rebounds, 3. And a, like, the numbers don't just immediately pop out at you. But you look at that roster, there's a lot of different guys who can do a lot of different things on that with Shamar. Shamar Avance, um, DJ Hughes out there, um, Dorian Hatton hit big shots. You have Omar Cooper and CJ Gunn kind of, you know, doing their thing. I think the biggest thing that was, to me, impressed about Tony was if somebody else had an advantage or had a match they can exploit, Tony wasn't like, well, hey, don't forget about me. You know, I still have to go get my 20 points a game. You know, if, if Shamar had... You know, a matchup he could take advantage of, or DJ had a matchup he could take advantage of. Tony was perfectly content, saying, "Yeah, let's let's keep feeding those guys, let them go after them." Um, and I, I thought that's really, you know, his numbers. If you put him on, you know, a different four A team, like say if you put him on a, a Pike or a, a Ben Davis, you're in another school in the Mick. I think his numbers could have been a lot better, but just with the overall depth that LN had this year. Um, Tony didn't have to go out and score 25 or 27 a night. I mean, he was perfectly happy, you know, if Shamar or DJ put up those numbers. That's a that's a good point. And, and to a to a person, I covered Lawrence North a lot this year. And, uh, you know, if you talk to any of those guys on that team, you know, their eyes kind of light up when they talk about Tony. And that, that sort of thing, I think, tells you a lot. You know, if, if you're the best player on the team, um, you know, you want – you want other guys to look at you that way, and I remember the uh, the sectional. I'm sorry, the uh, uh, Marion County tournament championship game. This is just kind of a, a, a aside, but you know, Omar Cooper late in that game made a big three pointer there at Southport against uh, Lawrence Central, and I remember talking to him after the game, and he's and Perkins had passed it to him on the wing. And, and Omar said, you know, Tony said shoot it, so I shot it. And, and I think that, that 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 tells you a lot. You know, it tells you a lot about Perkins had a lot of confidence, you know, in the guys on his team, and that kind of made them more confident. And I think Lawrence North, as a, as a program, uh, hasn't had that these last few years. They haven't had a guy who kind of would rally the troops together uh, like, like Perkins did this year. And, and – you know, and you look at those numbers, and yeah, that's not you know, like Jeff said, it's it's not 28 points a game, and it's not uh, you know 11 rebounds a game or whatever. But 
you know, he did a lot of things right. Uh, and I think the, from the standpoint of, of being a leader, um, you know, and there's other guys that, you know, are the same way, but I think he really showed this year that what that's all about. And I think that's something, you know, he, he'll leave that mark on the program. I think if those guys uh, behind him uh, kind of take that to heart, because he, I thought all year long, he was, he was that type of guy. And uh, I was always impressed with the way his teammates talk about him. I think that, that always tells you a lot about a player. Yeah, and I and think go, go ahead, Trevor. Go ahead, Trevor. Uh, and to kind of go along with that. He played his best in those big games against Lauren Central when they really needed to rise to the occasion. It seemed like he was the one to kind of lead the charge there and be that leader you talked about, Kyle. Yeah, and I was going to add, Kyle, I know you and I were sitting next to each other. The first half of that LNLC sectional game might be the most impressive. 16-minute um, stretch that I've seen in a high school basketball game in a while because I remember, Kyle, we were just sitting next to each other at the scores table. And we just kept looking at each other like, oh, man. <laughs> like, this is, oh, man, this is this is incredible because they, I mean, it's, it's LC. You have, you know, three high major basketball players in Dre and Tay Davis and Nigel Pack. It's a huge rivalry game. It's at LC. Ellen had beat them twice, so you know LC is going to going to be out for blood in that game. And the display that Ellen put on, and really, you know, Tony led the charge in that, and it wasn't all scoring. It was, you know, locking people up. It was getting rebounds, getting stops, getting out of transition, making sure the right people got the ball. Um that was incredibly impressive to watch that display. And I think that's, you know, if you could take that 16 minutes and say, this is what leadership from your best player looks like, it's enabling your teammates to come out and play in a way that you can perform like that. Yeah, I, I agree. By the way, Perkins headed to Iowa. I don't know if I mentioned that, but uh, yeah, just a, just a phenomenal year. And that, like you said, Jeff, that span, you know, when they're playing at, when they were playing at their best, you know, I'm not sure anybody would touch them. And not to say, you know, they're, no team is going to play like that all the time, but, th- but their ceiling uh, as a team was as high as oh, just, I mean, a lot of teams that I've covered, they're about as high as anybody when they're playing at their top level. Uh, very, very impressive, clearly. And while we're talking about Lawrence Central, uh, let's, let's touch on their two uh, guys who really, you know, I thought these last three years, um, you know, we're, we're a huge part of what Lauren Central did under Al Gooden. Uh, they, they made it through the sectional last year and then lost in a kind of a surprising game to Ben Davis in the, in the morning uh, of that regional over at uh, Southport. And, of course, Ben Davis then goes on and makes a, makes a deep run. Uh, but that Lauren Central team was really clicking on all cylinders and, and just didn't play great in, in that game. And you always wonder, too, about, uh, you know, what could have happened, you know, if they could have got through that game and, and, uh, and advanced in the tournament. But, uh, you know, this year they were 22-0 and other than those Lawrence North games. So, you know, you, you look back at it and it's like, man, you know, it seems disappointing, you know, the way they finish. But – uh, in reality, they beat everybody on their schedule except one team, and they lost to them three times, which is probably one of the more unusual uh, records. You know, when, when you look at that, that's just so so bizarre that that could happen. But uh, DeAndre Davis uh, headed to Louisville. He averaged 21.5 uh, points, 8.7 rebounds, and uh, shot 57% from the field. Finished his career with 1,192 points and 516 rebounds. So, uh, really good statistics for uh, DeAndre Davis. And then uh, Nigel Pack headed to Kansas State. This year was 17.7 points, 4.2 assists, 4 rebounds, and 2 steals. And uh, shot 93% from the free throw line this year. I thought that was a notable statistic. Uh, 1,085 points and 266 uh, career assists. So, you know, both those guys, hard to say one without the other. So just kind of talk about both of them here. And uh, they were, you know, like I said, very big part of what Lawrence Central did these last three years, uh, kind of getting that program going again and uh, in, in the, uh, you know, in the, in the post-Kyle Guy era, I guess you could say, uh, you know, and, and got that program to a sectional title last year for the first time since uh, 2012. Uh, which uh, Jeremy Hollowell was part of that team. He was over there watching uh, during the sectional, uh, talked to him a little bit. But, 
uh, they couldn't quite get through, and, and it wasn't even close, really. It wasn't, you know, they, they ended up making a little bit of a run uh, late in the game against LN, but, you know, you can't say that was ever really much of a game, and uh, that was shocking, you know, that they couldn't uh, play closer uh, in that game considering. But there's just something, I don't know if it was a bad matchup or what it was, but uh, they were unable to get through Lawrence North. But, you know, when you look back, uh, great careers for both those guys. I don't think they're probably going to, either one of them, win Mr. Basketball, but but uh, we'll put them in this, this discussion because I think they probably belong on, on the short list. Yeah, and going into the season, I kind of debated how much are they going to split votes. Say they, let's say Lord Central would win the state heading into the year. How would they split the vote, votes in that situation? Would you know, people rely on what they did over the regular season and try to distinguish one from the other? Or would they just rely on the postseason to determine that? I thought that was always going to be an interesting debate um, going forward. But um, for the season, I thought Dre Davis really brought some toughness to Lawrence Central. Kind of played in that undersized four role where he was rebounding, defending multiple positions, um, really just being that backbone of the LC team. And then, like you said, Nigel Pack, great shooter, um, was fantastic. Anytime he got open, we were talking about Bryson Barnheiser's range. Nigel Pack was just inside that. If he's open from 23 or 25 feet, he was going to hit it too. So, um, Just the overall careers of both were fun to watch, especially Nigel Pack kind of going from a small D1 prospect to a high major kid in the last year or so. That was fun to watch. And, um, just overall, a great career for both of them. Yeah, I agree, too. You know, we talked about, you know, I know Trevor and I at the beginning of the year, who our favorites were, and I think, um, you know, privately conversation, I thought, you know, Nigel Pack heading into the year, I thought was, you know, my leading candidate at the start of the year, and obviously um, that, you know, can change with, with how the year plays out, but you look at, you know, both of them, and like, you said there's a little bit of a gap that they had to step up into because Jake LaRavia graduates last year who was a phenomenal player in Indiana All-Star in his own right. Um, they lost Wesley Jordan, who was really their only inside player um, that they had last year. So um, really Dre had to step up to a lot of that, you know, doing a lot of the dirty work inside. He had to guard post players. He had to, you know, fight against bigger guys for rebounds. He had to, you know, protect the rim. Um, and then Nigel has to take a lot of the playmaking role that, um, you know, maybe got shared a little bit last year. Now more of that's falling onto his shoulders this year. Um, and obviously, you know, Kyle, like you said, they handled all of that except for the team, you know, three miles up the road. Yeah, and, and uh, like I said, that's just kind of bizarre, you know, and, and the fact that they – I really thought that sectional game was going to be – one of those epic type of games, and it really just wasn't. It was an epic performance by one epic team. performance <laughs> in the first half, that's for sure. But not an epic game. Uh, so, you know, that team was better. You know, they were better last year, uh, even even with Tay Davis uh, getting better throughout the year. Man, he had a, he, he looked good in the – very good in that sectional game. He was, and he you can see why he's going to be a, a lot of fun to cover and watch these next couple of years. Uh, but, uh, you know, and also I think Pack, you know, Pack battled a little bit of a knee injury throughout the year. That that didn't help and, uh, you know, missed a few games too. But uh, when all said and done, both those guys will get their, their uh, numbers on the wall, their jerseys on the wall, and I think uh, rightly so uh, for sure for both of those guys. And I agree with you, Trevor. I thought – you know, if there was ever, you know, before the season, I was like, if there's ever a year where you could have a co-mister basketball type of situation, if they go on and do what they were hoping to do, uh, because their stats are just so similar and they're different type of, pl- they're different players, but you know, one, you know, Nigel's better in certain areas, and and you can't say one's more valuable than the other. No, I think. no, I don't think at any point you could ever really. Uh, pick one over the other. To me, it was always they're always together, which is kind of cool. You look back when every time you think about Pack, you'll think of Davis and and vice versa. So I think that's a that's a cool thing for those two. Uh, I wanted to also touch on uh, uh, Trey Galloway and Anthony Leal uh, as we talk about these Mister Basketball uh, candidates and and kind of wrap things up here. But Galloway, another guy, 
other I think you mentioned earlier, Jeff, was you know battled a, a wrist injury. He, actually, each of the last two years, so he missed a little bit of time this year, and uh, you know probably hurt his shooting again a little bit this year. But you know he's a guy who does a lot of other things really well anyway, and uh, ends up averaging uh, twenty point nine points a game. Uh, 5.5 rebounds, 5.2 assists, which that's an impressive number, and 2.3 steals, which is also uh, a really impressive number. They went on a 15-game winning streak to close the season and win a, a sectional championship. They had moved up uh, from 3A to 4A this year, and I thought I had a pretty good chance to make it to the semi-state. Uh, Galloway ends up with uh, 1,537 points and also uh, the all-time school assist leader for a, for a career. So, uh, really good numbers overall for Galloway. Uh, does everything. Like I said, he's a he's a hardworking type of player who uh, you know is is a is does a lot of. He'll fill the stat sheet, and it doesn't have to be points all the time. So, uh, what are you guys' thoughts on Galloway? What do you think of his Mr. Basketball uh, chances? Start with you, Trevor. Uh, kind of like you said. I mean, he's a hard worker. He sets the tone defensively. Uh, Culver Academy needs would always put him on. The other team's best player in, in tight situations, either like Wesley or Sincere McMahon. He was always kind of tasked with shutting those guys down. And obviously, they did a great job of it down the stretch and really became a contender in 4A. Um, like you said, I thought they had a great chance to win that Michigan City uh, regional. And from there, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So, um, overall, great career. Um, like you said, his shooting never really came around at the high school level. He shot much better uh, last summer for Indiana League, but he was still able to get to the basket basically whenever he wanted to draw fouls and just kind of create the, the offense for Culver Academy. So even when he's not scoring a bunch, he's still doing a lot for uh, the Eagles to win games. Yeah, and he's, you know, we talk about um, these five on here, and obviously who knows what would have happened this year, like we've uh, repeated a lot, but he's the um, the one kid who's, you know, been in the state finals, um, won, um, you know, a lot of games in his high school career, um, been in the state finals, I think twice. Yeah, he won a um, state championship, so yeah, he's one of the few. Won a 3A title as a sophomore, and then a runner-up last year. Yeah, so he's been been to Banger's life twice. Um, you know, I don't think – they're another school, kind of like we talked about with John L. Davis, the all-star team. They're not from the Indy area, but they do play a lot of Indy area schools. You know, it's um, his name recognition. Obviously, he's going to Indiana. Um, people around the state know him. Um, has has had a phenomenal career. Um, you know, somebody who's definitely deserving of this. Um a lot of people thought, I think, Culver stepping up and going into 4A this year, um, maybe they take a, take a step back. You know, they lose um, Ethan Britton Watts, the you know, playmaking guard off their, um, you know, state you know, finalist teams. And who's going to step up and fill that void? And you know, we're really thinking it was going to be Trey that would step up into the playmaking role. Uh, but he did that really well, even with all the, the added attention he had. You know, he had good players with him, Deontay Craig and Nick Hiddle in the front court. But in terms of the guard spot, you know, this was about as thin as Culver had been. And Trey really stepped up into, you know, being able to make plays for others while also um, scoring on his own, which I thought was really impressive uh, for his play this year. And then finally, uh, Anthony Leal, who will be uh, teammates of Galloway at IU next year. And uh, they've been teammates before uh, with Indiana Elite uh, in the summertime, so they know each other uh, really well. And uh, Leal this year, 18.2 points a game, 4.3 rebounds, and uh, finishes his career the all-time career scoring leader at Bloomington South with, with uh, 1,617 points. Uh, of course, he was a core junior all-star last year, so we kind of knew – you know, Anthony would be among those guys that, that would be in the in contention. And uh, he put together a, a solid year uh, for a team, you know, I say solid, uh, really good year. And uh, statistically, uh, as well as uh, team, team-wise, team because Bloomington South 26-0 and and had won a sectional championship uh, when the season had ended. So, you know, I think everybody was looking forward to the potential. And I know there was 
still teams in the way of this happening, but uh, Bloomington South potentially playing Lawrence North in a semi-state uh, would have been a lot of fun. Uh, two two really great teams and, and two great players in Leal and Perkins, who are seniors, uh, possibly battling it out for uh, Mr. Basketball potentially uh, in that game. So that game never happened and, and maybe would have never happened, you know, depending on what happened in the regional. But regardless, uh, Anthony Leal, uh, one of those guys that's going to be uh, – and I, I will say this, I think – he will benefit, I think, from uh, you know maybe being the only guy in Southern Indiana uh, that that really is a strong contender this year, and, and uh, I think that will help him along with all of his accomplishments uh, to this point. I think maybe that could help him uh, in the voting somewhat uh, because of that reason. But uh, your guys' thoughts on uh, on Anthony Leal? Now, like you said, with Bloomington South going undefeated, him having a great year. I think that kind of just puts him in great position to win it, um, especially with the, the tournament coming to a halt. You don't get to see if Tony Perkins would be able to lead LN to the state title or Trey Galloway kind of pull some upsets and gets them to the uh, state finals. So I think the uh, state final being canceled kind of works in Leal's favor other than if they would have been undefeated and won a state title, obviously. But with it ending right now, it's hard to argue with his resume, especially for the season going 26-0 and him being the leader of that team. Um, a guy that's a good defender, really good spot-up shooter, can drive off the dribble, create contact, and then obviously scores in transition above the rim. So just an overall really good player and a great career for Mount Anthony Leal. Yeah, and we kind of talked about, I mentioned this with Tony Perkins, the numbers maybe don't pop out at you if you just look at the, you know, box score or stat line with 18 and a half points, four and a half assists, but that's a really good, obviously, to be undefeated Bloomington South team. You know, Connor Hickman um, can do a lot of things. Noah Jagger, the Bombas, um, that's a team that has some, has some balance and has guys who can, you know, go off on any given night. So Anthony's not asked to go out and get 25, 27 a night, you know, he can get, um, you know, 12 to 15, but he's going to affect the game in a lot of different ways and take attention off of those other guys and allow them to flourish too, kind of the same way Tony does. So I think those two are pretty similar in that way in that, yeah, maybe the, the raw numbers aren't, you know, outstanding or, you know, what you maybe would think, but how they go about getting those numbers and what they do for everybody else on their roster, I think really, um, in my opinion, sets them apart, you know, those two from, from everybody else. And one of the reasons why uh, Leal doesn't score that many points, but the Southern Indiana schedule, you know, he, there were a lot of games he only played a half, and then they were up by so much that he didn't really play again, so... I think that kind of holds down his raw numbers as well. If you're looking at his points per game, you kind of have to consider that too. Yeah, every uh, every situation is different, um, you know. And I, I know some people are like, "Well, how can you, you know, how can you can compare this guy to this guy? He's averaging 28 compared to 18." And every every player is in a different situation, whether. You know your teammates, or or the style of play that you're playing. You know, not every you can't just you can't just blind resume yeah. statistics. You know, it's and, and you have to look at efficiency too. Yeah, and competition level. Who are they playing in a night night in night out basis? I think that plays a huge factor, especially when you're just looking at volume numbers. Right, Trevor. I think you weren't you at the. I thought one of the big moments this year was when Bloomington South beat uh, Silver Creek uh, and Leal made the last second shot to beat Silver Creek. You, you were at that game, right? Yeah, it was. That was probably the best I've seen Anthony Leal play. That first half, he was just unstoppable. I think he had like 18 or 20 at halftime, just going off the dribble, hitting threes. That was kind of like Anthony Leal at his finest right there. And then, like you said, um, a tie game. Leal gets the. I think it was tied. Leal gets the ball. Yeah. One dribble, uh, about 20, 21 feet from the top of the key, and drilled it. It's a buzzer went off. So that was definitely a defining moment for for Leal and Bloomington South in the season. Yeah, I thought I thought at the moment that could have been that type of moment to to help put him over the top, or at least get him 
uh, to the top of the discussion as we got into the tournament. Uh, so that'll, you know, kind of touch on all of the, the Mr. Basketball guys, all of the Indian All-Stars, and, and some of the near misses. Um, you know, just generally, guys, this has been kind of a, a, a downtime. I know a lot of, you know, we're losing a lot of people in the basketball community, and, and it's just been a, you know, just a downer these last uh, couple weeks uh, as this uh, coronavirus has is, is kind of grabbed hold of our world and, and everybody's world uh, right now. But, you know, from a from a basketball perspective, um, you know, to miss out on the tournament is one thing, uh, and, and it becomes less and less important, I think, as, as you know, we kind of go through this uh, pandemic and, and this quarantine. But, um but still, I think, you know, years from now, when we look back at this, it'll, it'll always feel a little bit different. And, and I don't know how we'll, you know, assess this season, you know, from a historical perspective, other than it was just, it was a weird time for our world. And, you know, right. it's it just, it's just, it feels different. It feels incomplete. And it feels like, you know, in some ways, like, when are we going to get back to some sense of normalcy? And, and I was looking this morning, you know, it was just one month ago. You know, Jeff, we we're talking about that that game where you know sitting by each other. Yeah. T- two days later was the semifinals of that sectional, uh, where Attics and 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 Lawrence North played, and and Warren Central and, and North Central played. And you know, I remember seeing Paul Logan uh, from from North Central, the AD there that night, and and talking to him. And you know, he's in good spirits. I talked to him the next week about something different you know, on the phone, and. And uh, now he's he's in the hospital and in in pretty bad shape with uh, w- with uh, coronavirus and it's just amazing kind of where we're at you know uh, just a month a month later after all of this and, and uh, you know it's just it's sad from a lot of perspectives life and death is one thing and, and basketball is 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 you know far far down on the list but uh, it's just it just it makes you wonder you know. 10 20 30 years from now and you look back at this and people wonder why wasn't there a you know a state championship awarded that year a state champion awarded that year and it'll always look it'll always look different i think and i don't know how we'll remember it exactly but hopefully we get back to some sense of normalcy where it does look (laughs) where it does look uh, it does look weird there's a rocking chair around the fireplace and grandkids will ask what happened well i (laughs) no state champions in basketball well let me tell you kids gather around grandpa kyle here and we'll i'll tell you the story and a couple things i i want to take a chance to say here you talked about paul logan i mean there might not be somebody who I don't know, but has been nicer and more accommodating um, to at least me in Indiana high school basketball. I mean, you talk about just an all around great human being. And I mean, I think I speak for everybody, man, we're hoping, you know, for the absolute best for Paul, because that would be a a huge void that no one person's going to be able to fill um, at North Central, um, if, if you know the worst does happen, so I mean we're all we're all thinking and, and hoping for for the best for him, and to kind of you know step away from that for a second. Um, somebody said this about college basketball, and I think it it maybe can apply to Indiana high school basketball. Here is you know if we go through and have the state tournament and state finals, we have that finality, and we almost only think of maybe the state finals or maybe one or two great tournament games. I think um, maybe this year we can look back on all the great regular season matchups I have because, yeah, we all look forward to sectionals and regional semi-state, state state tournament, all that, but there's a lot of great basketball being played in December and in January and Marion County tournament and city tournament and other, you know, conference tournaments and county tournaments around the state. And I think, you know, maybe we should focus on those memories from this year. You know, the great games that are played, you know, not on the the third Saturday in March, but, you know, the second Friday in January or, you know, the, the third Saturday in, in December, you know, there's great basketball that happens from the first week of the season all the way through to the end of the regular season. And maybe this year is what, you know, we can look back and say, you know, there's great basketball going on at all points of the season throughout the state and really appreciate, you know, what it is to go through an entire high school basketball season because we saw what happened when the end gets taken away from us. But let's not forget all that happened leading up to that point 
and all the great basketball we did get a chance to see this year. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And also, you know, the sec- sectional 10, which, you know, I was there every night, uh, uh, except for the except for one night, but it was there three nights of that. And uh, it was it was great basketball. Um, unfortunately, you know, we've lost, you know, four people who I know who were there uh, that week. And it, it makes you wonder, you know, if we should have been there. And we didn't know, you know, we didn't know at the time you know it was spreading like it was and you know that's a discussion for another day but um but we did get to see the sectional at least and you know i I don't know you know definitely no finality uh of feeling to this tournament but there's bigger things to worry about right now and uh you know i I think it was it was a really fun season i thought and and a lot of things to look forward to you know as we get into next year and and Along those lines, as we wrap it up here, uh, just give me a give me a guy you think is a Mr. Basketball contender next year, a guy or two or, or three, uh, because that class, you know, as we know and, and have followed, is a really good one. Um, so who who do you kind of like next year? Maybe a, a guy or two to to win that award. Uh, I would go with three main ones because it looks like Christian Lander is going to reclassify the twenty twenty and be out of that discussion. I go with Trey Kaufman of Silver Creek, Caleb First of Blackhawk Christian, and then Blake Wesley at South Bend Riley. All three of those guys are high high major prospects and have been producing at a super high level, especially this year, but throughout their high school careers. So I think those guys are the front runners at this point at least um yeah i'm going to i think you know obviously we talk about how amazing the 2021 class is in indiana and um i'm going to echo i think my two favorites um are two that trevor mentioned caleb first and trey cop and those are guys who won state titles as sophomores were among the favorites to win state titles as juniors and now next year i mean you look both those teams return pretty much everybody they're going to be the favorites to win state titles in their respective classes um again next year so you look at two state titles in three years um potentially for those two guys could could have been three in three years if you um you know would have maybe played out this year we don't know but i think i think those two um i would i'm interested to see how jalen blackman returns from the knee injury i know kyle you were there at the game i think against cathedral when he got hurt Mm -hmm. um and that you know he's a kid who marion i think has a chance to be pretty good next year even in 4a he's going to put up big numbers um you know, if they can make a run, you know, he's, I think, a name to be in, in consideration there. Um, and then you look you look around the state, there's so many talented kids. You look at, you know, Luke Goody at Homestead. Um, you go down to, um, you know, southern Indiana and, and see some of the kids there. Um, it's such a deep class in the state. You know, I think there's obvious front runners, but... You know, I don't think, you know, in in early April of 2019, anybody was saying Tony Perkins was going to be a serious Mr. Basketball contender. He's obviously a good player, but maybe we didn't think of him at that level. Is there somebody that's going to make a jump like Tony um, this year? Jeff, as the uh, president of the Tony Perkins. You are the president of Tony Tony Perkins. uh, I'll feel that. (laughs) Yes. Trevor, I I will give Trevor credit. Trevor was... uh, Trevor was the one pulling the locomotive out of the station on the Tony Perkins train. Um, he called that before I think anybody else did. But, um, you know, do we see a kid make a jump like that, like Tony did, from being a, a good prospect to now, hey, this is one of the best kids in the state. Uh, you know, does somebody make that jump next year like we saw uh, with Tony this year? Um, that maybe we don't put up in that Caleb first Trey Kaufman class, but with their play next year is going to elevate them. What about Luke Brown? Yeah, I think, you know, that's – he's definitely a name. He's going to put up points. I think people um, may look at the schedule they play and, and wonder, you know, 
what would Luke do if he was, you know, at, you know, Center Grove, you know, playing in the Mick, you know, or, or, or at LN, you know, what would he do against that schedule? I think it's natural when, you know, it's maybe a non 4 a guy. People wonder about strength of schedule a lot. Um, it's going to be interesting to see because that Hall of Fame next year, you know, one of the best 2 A teams. Blackhawk Christian will probably be the best 2 A team. Um, and then Bar Reeve, a really good 1 A team. I mean, you're looking at three of the best 2 A teams in the state probably um, next year in that Hall of Fame tournament. So that should be a fantastic event. Um, but I think Luke's definitely. Um, maybe he's that guy that we don't think about. Uh, we think about just putting up a bunch of points against maybe some lesser competition. You know, if he can go in and, you know, hang 45 on Blackhawk next year in Hall of Fame, you know, or, or have a couple huge games against really good competition, you know, maybe he's that guy. Yeah, that'd be uh... – I think he's capable of that, and uh, you know he'll, he'll have a lot of he'll have a lot of support. I think uh, from that part of the state as well. Also, uh, um, you know Trey Kaufman. Well, should mention Trey Kaufman won the uh, Gatorade Player of the Year for Indiana, which which uh, historically has been a a pretty good indicator of you know probably winning it again next year, and also you know has bull, has bowled well for others to win Mr. Basketball. Uh, so that's I thought that was interesting. He won that award instead of a senior this year, which I was a little bit surprised by that, but not not shocked. But uh, I was surprised they didn't pick a senior, uh, regardless. But that that class is really good. You mentioned Christian Lander, uh, most likely will be uh, not in this this class and, and uh, going early to IU. I, that's not a finalized situation, but it appears to be headed that direction. And uh, of course. He'll miss out on some of this stuff as far as high school goes, but uh, looking to get on campus early uh, there at IU and help out the Hoosiers. So uh, that will change that class significantly uh, if that does happen. So uh, that would obviously take him out of the mix for Mr. Basketball. But several others who who, who are deserving and, and uh, like you mentioned, a really, really good class uh, overall. So uh, that will be fun to watch next year and, and uh, as we get back to basketball. Uh, at some point here, hopefully this summer, uh, still holding out hope that maybe some AAU basketball will be able to, to get out and see some of that uh, in July maybe. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with that. It's recruiting is kind of weird right now, and, and you know, we're just kind of in a weird state as a, as a country. But uh, uh, hopefully some normalcy coming here in a few months. But I uh, wanted to, to thank you guys for coming on and, and, and talking basketball, and uh, it's, it's, it's fun to – you know, assess this all-star team and, and just talk some hoops. Uh, so appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, thanks for having us, Kyle. Yeah, it's always good to uh, to talk. And if we need a basketball fix, Kyle, let's get the three of us together and go find a Gus Macker tournament. <laughs> we would uh, – that, that, that might end civility right there. <laughs> <laughs> we could run through the loser's bracket, I think. I definitely, definitely. The, uh, the bronze bracket will, will never <laughs> – Never expect what we could throw out there. Well, I'm ready. I'm ready when you are. So, all right. Well, hey. I, don't know, I don't know if I'll ever be ready, so you might have to wait on that one. Well, that's true. That's true. Well, thanks for coming on, guys. Hey, thanks for having us, Kyle. Thank you.